I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. And there was a rally that I had to cover. So when Patty Poblete was at her time assigned me to cover it, what was I supposed to tell her? Like, I'm undocumented and I can't cover this rally? So I went ahead and covered it. I was so scared when I was at the Washington Post that they were going to keep assigning me these immigration stories because my name is Jose. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds nerds. of sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. You know, it was my time to just make the movies that I wanted to make. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic in it. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hi. <laughs> You're here for a conversation this evening with two innovators who are pushing the limits of learning. Uh, those innovators are, of course, Khan Academy's Saul Khan and Kimberly Bryant of Black Girls Code. So give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. I'm Nicole Falk, a producer within Forum, the Commonwealth Club's Innovation Lab. We hope the video you just saw spoke to you in some way. It represents the culture and meaning and impact that Inform events work to deliver on. Uh, you can support what we do by becoming a member of the Commonwealth Club, becoming a sponsor. Uh, thank you to Oracle and Microsoft this evening. And uh, you can also come to our events. We're really excited about a series we have this, uh, this year with Salcon interviewing pioneers people who are pushing the limits of learning, pushing the technology limits. And uh, stay tuned, later this year, he's gonna be interviewing Megan Smith, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. We'll let you know. You can check out some of our upcoming events at informsf.org. So in the last 15 minutes of the program, Kimberly Bryant is gonna be answering your questions live. 
Saul's going to give you a cue when it's time to line up on the very far wall of the theater, and then we'll have a staff member pull you over to the mic. A reminder to ask short, one-part questions that are actually questions. Thank you. Uh, so let's get to it. Um, in 2011, only 6% of STEM workers nationwide were black, and that's up only four percentage points in the last 40 years. So how are we gonna diversify these industries? Uh, Kimberly Bryant has an answer. And like most good answers, she thinks it starts with young women. Young women of every color. Um, and you know, we're all here tonight to talk about engaging in technology and everyone's looking for a little bit of programming know-how. So I have the great honor of welcoming to stage three students of Black Girls Code, uh, a 12, a 14, and a 16-year-old and they're going to teach you a little something that you need to know. Um, so please welcome to stage Kai, Sasha, and Kimora. So, hi, my name is Kai Morton, and I'm 16 years old. Can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, I am 16, year old, 16 years old. I am a programmer, a sprinter, an Odell Dragon, a bassist, guitarist, a gamer, and a golfer. And I hope to go to MIT when I go to college. <laughs> Thank you. So for me, coding has changed my life significantly. After being a shy girl who was afraid to speak and speak and get out of her comfort zone, I can see that I've changed tremendously into <laughs> I've changed tremendously into someone who can make a lot of change in her world. So programming acted as a catalyst, a bridge to my understanding, connecting the concepts that I learned in class to something I could see and alter. The algebra concept concepts that I failed to understand suddenly made sense, and I began to blossom until my friends and peers would come to me for help. So you can see for the 12-year-old Kai to present day, 12-year-old Kai who was just learning to code to present day, that coding empowered her. And it opened the doors to understanding so I could see that I can make an impact on the world around me. Through BGC, I've had the opportunity of a lifetime to travel the world, meet amazing and intelligent people, and speak in front of hundreds. And that's how I know for sure that coding and technology has changed my life. And I'll pass it off to Sasha with her story. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Williams. I'm 14 years old and I'm in eighth grade and I go to St. Isidore School. I'm first gonna tell you a little bit about myself and then I'm gonna go on to quick steps on creating awesome and amazing apps. <laughs> so, ever since I was young, I've had many passions in my life, from cheerleading, volleyball, dance, singing, drawing, acting, and computer design. Oh, like so much. <laughs> but one of my main passions in life is performing arts. I love singing, acting, and dancing in front of huge crowds, just like this one. But then I have all my other passions calling me too. So I found a quote one day. It said, create your own opportunities because if you can dream it, you can achieve it. And I believe in that so much. And that's exactly what I told my mom when she was talking to me about my plan A and plan B for life in college. I'm like, well, mom, why can't I have it all? Why can't I have my love for performing arts and my love for technology as well, all wrapped up into one? And that's what my plan is to do. My plan is to be an entrepreneur when I grow up. <laughs> and that's how technology has changed my life. It has taught me that I can use all my passions in new and exciting ways. And I cannot wait to see what technology and Black Girls Code has in store for me. Next slide, please. <laughs> So now I'm gonna teach you how to create an awesome app, but in quick, quick, quick way, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so first, what is an app? 
An app is a self-contained program designed to fulfill a purpose, usually downloaded on a mobile device. So when you open up your Android or iPhone, that's an app, that little col colorful square, that's an app, by the way, okay? <laughs> Parents. <laughs> so to create an app, you use an app application software. An application software is to set one or more programs designed for a permanent form, perform of functions, tasks, and activities. So, what you, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, where can I find an application software? A couple examples are by Balsamic, Appery, and App Inventor. Balsamic, you can first have a visual mock-up of exactly what you want on your app. Then you can go to Appery.io and design the exact same design that you put on Balsamic, but you can download it to your phone so you can see how it will look with real buttons. Then after that, you can go to App Inventor and finally code your app. But we're not gonna go in coding right now because, well, quick, quick. <laughs> so next slide, please. So, but before you go into the application software and you do all of that, you have to first come up with your ideas. Number one, strategy. Think different, step outside of the box, come up with a creative idea for your app. But when you're coming up with an idea, make sure it involves the community as well so you know how you can help it. But also, go into the Apple store so you know you don't steal the same idea from someone else. You wanna make sure you come up with your own original idea. Step two, design and development. Make your prototype, then product, so you can make sure you're fixing all the mistakes you make in your prototype to final product. Also, come up with a good name for your app too, so you can interest your consumer, because then it's like, what's the point? <laughs> After that, you have to finally send it out there into the world. Step three, send it out there. And then after you do that, make sure you put feedback on your app so you know the mistakes you can make, so you know the mistakes that you made, and also you can like fix them and send them in your later updates. And that's how you create an awesome app. Now to Kimora. Okay, so hi everybody, I'm Kimora, and today I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm 12 years old and I go to East Bay Innovation Academy. My motto is, you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. And that one right, that picture right there, I put that there because I think that it represents the way that I think. And the college sign is because I plan to go to college. Well, Stanford is where I plan to go. My three main passions are dance, art, and coding. And I love dance and art because you can express your emotions in so many different ways when you're doing either of them. And I love coding with Black Girls Go Code and Kimberly because it's fun and it's exciting and it's really challenging. So I think that's it. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so it's me again. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit about HTML. So what is HTML? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, which is a set of codes used to create a web page. Um, okay, now next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so here's some tips and tricks on HTML. So the first tip is that if you want to bold your text, you have to put a B in between the less than and greater than sign before the text that you want to bold. And then you have to do the same after the text that you want to bold, but this time with the backslash. And the backslash indicates that you want to end your code. You have, to do, you have to use the less than and greater than signs for all the other types of tips and tricks that you see on the slide. Like if you wanna italicize your text, you put an I in between the less than and greater than signs. And if you wanna underline your text, you put a U. But for font color, it's a little bit different. If you wanna change your font color, you have to put font color equals red. And then to end it, you'll put backslash font. And if you wanna center your code, you have to put the word center in between the less than and the greater than sign. So now you probably wanna go build your app on Mozilla Thimble right here. So, and of course you want to build an amazing one, right? So, and you're gonna want people to refer to it. So you should put a link that's going to your awesome website. So you have to use A-H-R-E-F, which stands for a hypertext reference, and then you're gonna put your internet URL, and then in the green, you're gonna put the name of your webpage, and then you end that with backslash A. Thank you, it's been fun teaching, go code. Uh, 
next slide, please. Or, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for listening to us. And right now, I'd like to welcome to the stage my mother, Kimberly Bryant, the founder of Black Girls Code, and Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy. I felt a little left out of that hug. Oh, Just I'm sorry. Feedback <laughs> for next time. It wasn't intentional. Yeah. A little bit, maybe. Uh, but. Yeah, no, I'm, I get it. Yeah. There's a, well, thanks for being here. Uh, Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So, I, you know, let's just start with, with the basics. What is Black Girls Code? So, I, I would like to I always like to say that Black Girls Code is a movement. Um, but it's, it's more than just a movement to teach kids how to code. Uh, in its essence, that is what we do. But it really is, like you saw with the students that were on the stage, about teaching girls self-confidence, teaching them self-efficacy, and giving them the skills and then sending them off into the world you know, as change agents. And, and really as, um, I guess, our best examples of the potential for girls in our community. Um, but from the, I guess, the purest sense, we are focus on training up the next generation of technology leaders and creators and doing that by engaging these girls in classes in computer science, robotics, web design, game design, and really making them you know, have a chance for the first time to put their voice into the design. And even, as you mentioned, it's, you, know, you almost view it more as a, a, a movement than just an organization. And it, yes. it even kind of stems from the name. I mean, when I, for, you know, it's, it's not Black Girls Who Code, which is how kind of a more traditional name. What, why, what was kind of the thought behind the naming? Well, it really stemmed on like literally traditionally like the, the page of all the names that it could possibly be. And so 2011, I was, you know, looking, really tooling this idea around in my head about this organization that would teach girls of color to code. And I, I literally like wrote all the ones down. I was like, kaleidoscope girls, how does this sound? Hey, girls of color code, how does this sound? Um, but, you know, I ended up writing on the paper one day, black girls code. And honestly, you know, when I wrote it, it was a bit shocking even to me, and I'm a black woman. And I remember I sat on that for a long time because I was like, this may be too radical. You know, how will people accept this? And I remember, and I was talking to Lisa Stone in a reception, that I was at one of the sessions at her very first blog, her bet um, uh, seminars that she was having for entrepreneurs. And I was listening to one of the speakers, who was actually another sister of Filipino descent. And I went up to her after with this paper, and I was like, I want to do this organization. And I want to call it Black Girls Code. And what do you think about that? And this was Annalisa, who is the founder of Global Fund for Women. And she said, I love it. She's like, I want you to pull out your phone right now. We're going to save all these names. We're going to get all the websites. I think it's fantastic because I connect with this name because I am a black girl, too. And I think at that moment was the validation I needed was to say that, yes, we are making a bold statement with this name of Black Girls Code, and it's okay. It, is, it represents something beyond just African-American girls because it really is, I think, putting blackness as, as a concept that can really transcend multiple cultures. And it's also, like we talked about before, very declarative. So I didn't want to say black girls maybe can code. <laughs> Black girls may like coding. Um, it was really specific that I wanted to say, this is something that girls of color do. This is something that girls of color can do well. And that's why it became Black Girls Code. And even, even you know, I, I sometimes maybe overly read into this, but you know, the, the code is in caps. Yes. It, you know, even when you, when you write it down, when you're typing, right. it's you know, capital C-O-D-E. 
Yes. And w I think the way we ended up putting code in CAPS was because we would often, when we first started out, have people ask us, oh, black girls code, what, what is the code? Can you tell me what the code is? <laughs> oh, they, thought, they thought like black girls code, right, like a secret, secret language. Code. Like, I this see, was like a like possessive. Secret, exactly. Oh, that's fascinating. And I was like, no, that's <laughs> not what we mean. <laughs> Although that could be. Yeah, that's you know, another organization now, you, right you there. You may yeah. not, it yeah. just depends. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we really wanted it to be, you know, clear that we were talking about coding and technology. And I, I thought that um, by changing it and putting in all caps, we would emphasize that we we're doing coding in the, in the really, in the pure sense of the word. And so how did you, I mean, you know, the, the, the stories of how you, you any founder of any organization, but especially I think a not-for-profit which has a social mission, um, how it gets started is, is always interesting. How did, what, what was the immediate catalyst that, that, that got you to, to start Black Girls Code? And then maybe we'll talk about kind of the, the broader background. Sure, so you know, at the end of 2010, I was you know, at a turning point in my career. So I had moved out to the Bay Area years before to work at a large biotech company and spent many, many years in corporate America and was ready to get the heck out of there. I was like, oh no, I can't do this anymore. And I had my opportunity when our company got purchased and, and I was able to take a package and, and move away from the company and really wanted to do something on my own. But not create a nonprofit. That's not my idea no. of fun. That'd be lame. Yeah. <laughs> At that time. And I, but I wanted to start a business, and I know I wanted to jump into this tech thing because I was like, oh, no, I, I, I want to get into this tech thing. You know, Twitter was just starting to take off. And I started to talk to lots of people, trying to figure out what I wanted to do in tech. At right about that same time, my daughter Kai, who was on the stage before, was about to start middle school. Now, because her mom is an engineer, I think it's, you know, just obvious that she would spend a lot of time around technology and computers. But, I mean, this kid was, like, wed to the computer like her Siamese twin. Like, literally, she stayed on the computer all the time, and it drove me crazy. Uh, she was heavily, like, into gaming. So, like, even offline games, you know, like, World of Warcraft, all kinds of crazy stuff. That wasn't me as a kid, so I, I just did not understand why you would spend all your time and waking hours playing a game, but she did. Um, but right about that time, I, she was just old enough where I could send her to summer camp, and I did. I found this fantastic summer camp to teach her computer science. It was at Stanford. She went there for the summer, and it was a life-changing experience for her. So before that, you know, and I was like, why do you spend all this time on these games? She was like, I just want to be a game tester and get all the new games the first time they come out. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, this is a waste of my money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, she was seriously, this is like a passion. So I was like, well, you know, you can build these things. Why don't you build this? And, but she didn't, that, didn't ha that didn't make sense to her as a concept. But after she went to that summer camp, And how did, old was she when she went she to the camp? She was 12. Okay. She was 12. And after she went to the summer camp, you know, did two things. First of all, she decided she wanted to attend Stanford. Now, that's mm. another story all it is. It seems like so. she got, yeah. her, her, it seems like her judgment improved since uh, yeah, then. Yeah, maybe. I'm hoping, was, hoping, uh, hoping, depending on who. Oh, Stanford, that's Sal, that's gonna, not I'm me. Gonna, I'm going to talk to Kamora. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it really did change her, her, her whole perspective in, in terms of life goals, but it also really changed her perspective of what she could achieve with technology. And that was fantastic. So I went and picked her up. She bounded down the stairs, and she's smiling. She had a great time. And when we were driving home back into the city, I was like, well, how did things go? And she said, they went well, but, you know, sometimes the guys, the instructors and TAs, they didn't really pay much attention to the girls in the classroom. And I reflected on when they were doing the presentations, when the parents were all there at the end, I probably saw like two girls, maybe, maybe five, it wasn't that many. And, and there were no other students of color in the classroom. And my heart sunk a little bit because I knew at that age of being in the middle school, you know, it's really like, it's really very, very sensitive age for girls, especially for girls. And I did not want her to lose this, that, that light, you know, when you see that light in your kid's eyes. I didn't want her to lose that. And so when I left, I was like, I am going to take my money out of my 401k and send 10 girls to this camp next summer. And that's, that's really all I wanted to do. And I started to talk to folks about it. 
And they're like, well, yeah, that would be great, but you know, why don't you just create it yourself? Why don't you create a camp? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> because I've been telling you, I really did not want to start a nonprofit. I just, I just did not want to do it. Um, but as I started to talk to people and really, you know, kind of tool this idea around in my head, I just realized that even if I send 10 girls next year, that may not be enough. Because I knew there were other girls that looked like my daughter, um, had certain interests like my daughter, that still would be left out. And I wanted to do something about that. And so that was the very first spark of the idea of doing something. I didn't really know what it may look like at that time, but doing something and building something that would specifically support girls like I. And you know, when, when you, your, your daughter tells you that story that maybe she wasn't getting the attention and that, the, uh, that, that there was very few people that she could directly relate to, and, or you observed this, I mean, to some degree it might have not been a surprise to you because you are an engineer yourself. Absolutely. And uh, you know, when you were going through school, I mean, what was, what was you, did, did you have similar experiences? I did, and I think that's the thing that, that hit me the most. That's the thing that like crushed my soul to the, to the core, and I'm just telling you, like, seriously, that it was. Because I remember, um, because I, you know, grew up as a young woman of color going to school to get my engineering degree in a very similar environment that looked very similar to that classroom that she was in that summer. And I knew, without a doubt, how difficult it would be. So, you know, growing up, she, she went, like most kids, through all the different phases of she wanted to be a veterinarian, then she wanted to be an artist, then she wanted to be maybe something else like a doctor. Then, it, you know, it just was like all these different things. So I never really thought, I never really thought that she might follow in my footsteps. I, I really never thought that this kid would become an engineer until that day. And knowing like all the things that I went through, like through my career and even before that, you know, as a student, one of the very few uh, women of color in my engineering class at Vanderbilt, I knew the road ahead was gonna be very difficult. And I was, a, I was concerned, like seriously concerned, um, because I think it takes a lot for any woman come to make it through these heavily male-dominated environments and to make it out with your sanity. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, that's a serious, I mean, you know, it is what it is. It's just, it's just a very, it's a very interesting, you know, it's a very interesting path, yeah. So I have like a hundred questions now. So, so <laughs> this is, so, and I, mean, this is, I think this is starting to get really to, to the, the core of the issue is that, you know, when, when you were growing up, first, when, when did you first feel the spark of that you might want to be an engineer or get into computers? When, when did that happen for you? Well, here's the thing. I, I grew up the middle child um, in my family. The, the crazy middle child, that, that really, really is me. And, um, but I had an older brother who was like my role model. He was like the person I followed around, I went everywhere with, I wanted to do what he did. He was really the computer geek in our family. That wasn't me. So I always say that... How much older was he? Two years two older. Two years older, okay. So and you know, I always say that in my family, and with my daughter and I, I'm more of a nerd. So I'm like the kid that reads all the books and checks out all the books from the library, as opposed to really being all into technology. That, that as opposed to the cool thing, like programming. Oh, yeah, 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 the fruits, yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> but I was the kid in the books. Um, and I really thought that I was going to be a lawyer growing up. That still like to be a lawyer, but uh, you know, in a, in a few years. <laughs> but I was never really the techie type. But I like science and I like math. So what happened was that because I was such a good student in math and science, the, the guidance counselors really directed me, like maybe you might want to look at this engineering thing. But I didn't know what that was, you know, because I, I grew up in the inner city of Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, like the deep inner city of Memphis. So that I did not see anyone that was doing anything. I, nobody owned a computer in, in my neighborhood. Nobody was doing anything with computer science. We were like the outlier kids in our, our clique. So we were the smart, nerdy kids that 
got sent to optional school programs because they were smart and they were good at their books, when all of our friends, not so much. And so it just was not something that I had aspired to because I didn't even know what it was. Um, but it was because of those guidance counselors really saying, this is something that you might want to think about, that led me to decide to apply to these schools, get accepted, and then find myself in this very first class in engineering at Vanderbilt. And when you, when you show up at Vanderbilt, you know, it sounds like you've had these great mentors to, to encourage you to get here, mm -hmm. but what was that like? I mean, you kind of alluded a little bit to it that, I mean, what, what, what was your first reaction, especially when you start showing up in some of these classes? Um, culture shock. Um, coming from the inner city of Memphis, ending up on the campus of the Harvard of the South, totally culture shock for me. It was like, Unreal. It's like landing on Mars and trying to figure out my way. So, you know, when you're a smart kid, and even if you're in a good school and you're surrounded by folks that look like you, that's a lot different than when you're placed in a classroom with no one that looks like you and no one that's really interested in and even telling you, like, what you need to do. So, so there's this first order of culture shock of just Vanderbilt is just very different than where you grew up. Mm -hmm. But then there's the second order of culture shock, which is kind of what we're here to talk about, which is, right. you know, not only were you at Vanderbilt, but you decided to be an engineer. Yeah. And so what, was, what were those first engineering? And, you know, this is, once again, it's kind of socioeconomically different, uh, but also in the engineering programs, it's also about, you know, it's, it's, it's male-dominated as yeah. well. Well, interestingly enough, when I landed at Vanderbilt, I wasn't initial, my degree is in electrical engineering, but that wasn't my first, you know, decided major. I thought I was going to go in, into civil engineering when I first got to Vanderbilt, primarily because I always have been a bit of a social activist, even when I was in school, I was in student government, very involved in, in community, community organizations, and I really wanted to do an engineering that was a little bit closer to civics and the, the, the people, so to speak. So I thought civil engineering was it. Um, but I had a rude awakening because I remember vividly um, when I graduated from high school, because I was in an honors program, I had lots of AP classes that mm -hmm. I took. You know, took AP Latin, don't ask me why, but okay, I, so I love You were no slouch. <laughs> yeah, I took, I took those type of things, but I also took AP Calculus, took AP English, et cetera. So I was able to like um, test out a lot of my first year classes. And I remember being in this, you know, first year civvy class with about 100 students sitting in the class, probably the only student of color, maybe it was another woman, I don't remember. And the professor asked, you know, well, how many of you have, you know, taken an AP class and you know, you got a three plus or something on the test? And in this big room, it's like the first week of school, nobody raised their hand. I looked around and I slowly raised my hand in the middle of this crowd. So me, this little one raisin in a, in a <laughs> sea of and, milk. Uh, yes, I don't, know. I don't know how to complete the metaphor. <laughs> yes. But yes that's the and the, the, the interesting thing was that the professor ignored me. Hmm. Oh, yeah. He ignored me, and, and he didn't even acknowledge me. And this was the, this professor ten, was actually the head of the, the civic department. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to react to that, because that wasn't, you know, I come from Memphis, I'm like an honor student, like top honor student, used to being recognized, used to being lauded, used to being encouraged. Totally different experience for me. And this was in my first week of classes. And I think, you know, I stayed in CV at least for like a couple of weeks until I could get the heck out of there. <laughs> but, um, but it was just a bit of a rude awakening for me as a student, and especially as a woman of color and a student of color, because I recognized without a doubt that, you know, this was, this was not Oz. And it was going to take a lot, you know, for me to be able to survive in that environment. So, so I mean, this, this is, I think, a really interesting thing, because... What do you think, why do you think the professor did that? Because I'm sure if we, you know, had a conversation with him, he'd probably, you know, say all his values and they're, they're probably not, you know, at least uh, for what he would say would not be so different than maybe what we would say. But something at least subconscious was going on with him, some form of, of bias. What, what, do you, what do you think is, was going on in his head or not going on in his head? Well, when I entered Vanderbilt at that time, you know, it was still just a, a minute number of students overall color that were in the school. 
So tiny number. So we were at a point in time where we were still, you know, like the new kids on the block, different. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe this was something that he did. He didn't think it was possible. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what he might say, but I, I believe, you know, his bias has told him that it could not be possible that this little black or brown girl who's sitting in this class with, you know, mostly men, mostly men that are not men of color, could be the only one that had this level of achievement. Mm. That just, I, I don't think it registered in his mind that that could be a reality. Yeah. And so he wasn't, a, he wasn't able to even recognize you it. You must be raising your hand for some other reason, not uh, yeah. the, the question that, right, that, that, right, he, right. that he asked. And I mean, you know, that's, that's week one. And then you, at some point you do transfer into electrical engineering, but I can't imagine it being any dramatically different, or was it? Well, it wasn't necessarily that it was dramatically different, but the thing that was different is that I found a mentor. So I'm walking around campus one day and I run into this upperclassman, tall sister woman that I just started to talk to. It was like the nicest person I ever met. And she, and she told me she was an electrical engineer. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And <laughs> tell me more about it. And this person uh, today is like one of my closest friends. But it was because of seeing a young woman of color that I could see myself reflected in, that was doing something that I may be interested in that made the difference. Because had I not met her, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I would have stayed in the School of Engineering. I'm not even really sure I would have stayed at Vanderbilt. Um, but that kind of speaks to how we feel about mentorship and why mentoring and having the girls to really have these role models is so vitally important. Being able to see yourself reflected in someone that's doing, leading a path that you may in the future, that's like critically important for girls of color. And that's, that was important for me. And so, you know, you've had these experiences uh, in college, through work, you see your daughter as she goes to the summer camp, it's kind of it reminds you of, of what, you know, and you're like, wow, it maybe didn't change so much. I mean, given all of that and given a lot of what I'm sure you've gone through at work and all of these other things, why did you think it's so important? Why don't, you know, why not just say, well, why don't you go into another field where it's going to be, you know, an easier path or where you, you will find more people like you? Why was it so important to, to say, well, no, no, focus on, on coding, focus on STEM? Well, it wasn't so much that I wanted her to particularly focus on coding, but that's what her interest was. And so for me as a mom, um, my goal was really to figure out what it was that she had a love of and figure out how I could support that. It just happened to be that it was technology. So had it been dance, had it been music, you know, maybe it would have been black girls who drum. I, I don't know what it would be. It would be. But, <laughs> It would be black girls drum. That black, black girls, girls drum. drum. No who in there. But yeah. um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it ended up being technology. And so for me, I think it did create you know a bit of a stronger bond for us as a mother and daughter because now you know I could see myself in her and perhaps she could see herself in me. But you know, you're saying it could have been black girls drum, but you know, in the day and age that we're in, I mean, do do you feel that there is an imperative? I mean. You know, there's one view that, okay, you want to make sure that anyone who does have an interest in that, that that interest doesn't get lost. Right. But do you think there's kind of an added imperative that actually maybe to, to foster more interest in this field? I, I do. I do now. So I, I absolutely, as I mentioned before, because I was looking to start this startup company in technology, I definitely saw the opportunities in the field. And now that, you know, my life work is focused on creating these, these next generation technologists, I see the benefit of her having this focus and other girls like her focusing on tech. So I'm not saying that there's not room and space for girls to um, have other, other interests and to really have organizations that support that. There are, but I think our key path and mission is really to see this generation of girls in technology. And, and, and so, you know, with that in mind, you start Black Girls Code. It started a very nascent, hey, maybe we should run some camps or after school programs. Mm -hmm. You know, fast forward today, what, what, what is it doing? What, who are y'all reaching and, and where do you see it going? One of the things I think we found very interesting uh, about Black Girls Code is that we didn't really know what we were doing in the beginning. So <laughs> I was lucky enough that I, I stumbled into a Code for America meeting one mm -hmm. night. And I had, again, hit the card again, 
I had these really crude cards that I had really like cut out of some cardboard paper, and I had put Black Girls Code, but then I knew the name at Your least. Your cards are dangerous. Yeah, my it cards. All these, that's all where, the, I, of, yeah. that's where the, the, yeah. the gold is almost gone. Yeah. I had these cards, and like literally serious, I cut out the cardboard and was taken around in Code for America. And the fellows that year was like, Black Girls Code, they asked me all about this. Like, this is really interesting. Um, we just talked to another guy who wants to do something similar for kids from underrepresented communities. You guys should talk. And my very first connection, who was really a coder, to come onto my core team was one of the Code for America fellows mm. that year. And so with that one resource and just three co-workers, we were able to like put together this idea of what we thought the girls would be able to do. And we just really, you know, we're kind of testing it out. So that's kind of always how we run is like really putting these ideas together and seeing what works. But the interesting was is that it took off. So I think it, we weren't really expecting it necessarily to take off like it did. So it started with the girls, you know, they jumped right in and they, they came back every week and they would outrun our curriculum. So they would do everything that we had planned for that Saturday and we would have to rush around at the end of the class and figure out something else for them to do. So we were like, oh, they like this coding thing. Okay, we might have something. And then when we went into the second year, we decided to kind of take BGC on the road and go to other cities. We were like, oh, it's pretty good here in the Bay Area. Let's try it in Atlanta. Let's try it in Chicago. And the organization really just started to grow exponentially. And so today, you know, we, we have kind of morphed into this chapter organization that has chapters across the U.S. We have a chapter in Johannesburg. And a long list, probably like I stopped counting this list of about 70 or so cities that want a black girl's code in, in their town. And how does that happen? If I'm in, uh, so when, you know, in Chicago, say when you all started, was it a, a kind of a local entrepreneur? Um, when we were just trying to figure this thing out, we had our very first grant come from Google. Mm -hmm. And now, to this day, why they took a chance on us, I don't know, but I'm glad that they did. Because yeah. you, you, <laughs> you seem like a bunch of slackers. I, I don't, don't know, know, I don't why, know. Why they invested but in you. They, yeah. they gave us this little seed grant in the, in the beginning, and that was like the start of, that just gave us a little bit of inspiration and kind of keep going because in the beginning you know as I mentioned I was like I really literally pay for everything out of my pocket because it just left this biotech company so we were yeah. well paid okay. <laughs> not like nonprofit but um, <laughs> that was the first grant we had and from that time we've been really lucky to have a strong community so in the beginning you know we did lots of crowdfunding and we were just overwhelmed by how much as a grassroots organization our community supported the work that we did. So we did one um, crowdfunding um, and I think that was in 2012, the first one, and we were like, oh, let's try to raise $20,000 because we were running out of money. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good time to raise money. Yeah, that's a good yes. time. But we didn't really know if we could raise $20,000, but we did. So we raised about $22,000, $23,000. We came around into 2013 and we were like, you know what, let's do it again. But let's set this big goal, let's raise $100,000. Now, we did not necessarily think that we could raise $100,000, but we were willing to try. And, you know, we were just blown away with the fact that we were able to hit that goal. And I think everybody else was surprised we were yeah. able to hit that goal, too. But I think it was testament to, you know, the strong community of supporters that we found from industry you know and even we get little checks like two dollar checks like from canada i don't know from how canada pe canada is like one of our biggest funders i have no Ooh. idea how people in canada know we exist <laughs> but they send us money all the time thank you canada wow. if you're listening to the live stream <laughs> um <laughs> they send us money all the time and you know so we've had we've seen the, the bunch of do-gooders yes yes I love it I love I love Canadians yeah. <laughs> but um we've had that grassroots support and now over the last couple of years we've really seen the support from other technology companies and companies that are not necessarily technology centric to really come into like a lot of the funding of the programs of the expansion. So I have a fundraising idea for you. All right. It's a little bit of a longer term. Okay. You should talk to the girls that are attending your program, non-binding contract, 10% uh -huh. equity of anything that they start. I I'm with and that. Just, 
I, I predict in about 15 years, yes. you will be funding other people. You no, will I, I, have that sounds like a pretty good idea for me, but I, yeah, I was non-binding. thinking more for like a retirement oh, plan yes. for myself. As a yeah, you should get in and actually <laughs> let me in on some of this too. All right. Um, so, I mean, taking, taking a step back from it all, you know, uh, and, and you're kind of in the center of this because you're here, you know, we're in the middle of, we're in Silicon Valley, yeah. and you're hearing all about, you know, um, uh, intentional or unintentional bias, you know, there's gender bias, there's racial bias. What, what, where do you think uh, this comes from and what do you think needs to be done, especially in Silicon Valley, we're at the heart of kind of the coding world here uh, mm-hmm. that, that could improve things? Well, one of the things I think that's interesting is that we it, look, we all have biases, mm-hmm. but then how does that actually move the dial? I mean, is it is it actually on kind of the grassroots that you kind of prove people wrong? Mm-hmm. That you know, like uh, you 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 and other groups ha- have enough enable enough uh, young women, young women of color to participate. That at some point the bias just breaks, or are there other kind of more systemic things that can be done. Well, I think this the answer to that is yes, and we can do more. Um, I think when I t- think about the pipeline and the pipeline issues, um, folks are often like, oh, no, it's not just a pipeline. It's not just K-12. through um, But when I say K- pipeline, I don't just mean K-12. through I mean K-12. through I mean, once kids graduate from school, go to college. I'm talking about once those graduates leave college and start their first roles in, in whatever company they choose to start in. I'm talking about once that woman or a person of color gets to middle management and they hit that glass ceiling that they can't reach above that. I'm talking about this dearth of people of color and women in the C-suite. So when I see the pipeline, it's all of that. I think that there are some serious systemic issues in every single segment of the pipeline. It, it's, as Frida K. Poor says, a leaky pipeline. It's, it's, not, it's not a pipeline that is sufficient. So having companies address issues in every, every point there and really put systems in place, so be that hiring, be that retention, be those um, how we evaluate women. We saw that in the case recently down, at, down the road a bit. All of that needs to be done. Then they also do need to invest in the pipeline so that we are continuing to build these new young technologists and giving them the opportunity to make it to that point that they can start in the companies. And that's, I mean, that's the interesting thing because, you know, if you, you know, the world today, obviously we have a a million things that that need to be improved. But if you look at the trend on, in most dimensions of, of, of the things we care about, the world is better today, even if it's not perfect than it was, you say, 20 or 30 years ago. But one of the fascinating things about uh, women in STEM, is, especially in computer science, is that the trend in, has, has actually gone the other way, where it's actually worse today than it was even 20 years ago, where the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think the percentage of women majoring in computer science has actually gone down by half. W- right. What, I mean, in almost every other field, at least the trend has been in a positive direction. This is a negative. What's the cause of that? Well, I kind of like rode the wave of that trend, that, that trend because when I graduated at the end of the 80s, they're supposedly, this is what the numbers say, 35% or so women receiving degrees. Now, as a woman graduating at that time, I can tell you, it did not seem like 30%. I don't know where the other 35% were, I, I don't know, because it didn't seem like that. So when I look at those numbers now, I'm like, wow. So it's less than it was then when I went to school. It's got to be really, really bad. Um, I think for me, when I look back on, the, on that, you know, what was happening in those years, that was like when the Mac was first a thing and people were just discovering the internet. And I think the industry overall changed a lot. Um, this whole what we call programmer culture, I think, started to grow and, and flourish. And I don't think that women felt that that was a place that they wanted to be. Um, for myself, you know, I ended up being in high voltage, like power companies, which is even less of a place a woman would probably want to be, um, but I was there. But I, I think in the tech industry in particular, it really became a sort of this male bastion and this, this, this ground for um, you know, really seeding these, these male-dominated tropes that women didn't see themselves fitting into. 
And, and, and that's interesting because and, and it, it, when, when, when I thought about that same problem, I was like, well, you know, because especially in the 90s and up till now, it seems like it's accelerating. The tech industry has become more kind of more multifaceted and it's become more media related, more right and left brain. Right. And so you think this would just bring more diversity, it would thrive for more diversity. But I think that, you know, this, I mean, what is that programmer culture? That well, I think it's just like the, the image of technology does not paint. When we think this whole concept of when you think about a coder, you think of someone that looks like Mark Zuckerberg with a hoodie and flip flops. Mm. I don't know any of my girls that walk around like that. They mm. just don't walk around like that. That would yeah. be uncool for them. Yeah. But that's when we think of a coder, that's the kind of the image that is propagated in society. So I think a part of, you know, kind of changing this narrative is, flipping the script on that. So when you think of a coder, thinking about students like Kai, Sasha, and Kimora, thinking about that image of a coder as opposed to someone that is, is ideally white, male, and geeky. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's what it is. What it is. <laughs> so one thing that I think will be fun to do uh, before, before we go to uh, questions is we like to do what we call a lightning round. Well, let me drink so, a cup. No stress. This is, we're amongst friends here. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> number one, favorite role model for your daughter? <laughs> you can. Okay, so can I ask a clarifying question? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Would this be her role model or my favorite role model? My, my interpretation is who would you want her role model to be? Mae Jemison. And who, and, and explain. So Mae Jemison was uh, one of the first uh, female astronauts of color. So she is, uh, she's a role model for me. She is a trailblazer. Um, my daughter just met her recently wow. at South by Southwest. And that's the kind of, I think, um, moxie I want my daughter to have in her career and whatever she does in the future. Favorite coding language? I'm going to go with Fortran just because it's go. old and there I'm old. There you go. <laughs> Nobody Fortran. Goes. Give Fortran. That's good. That took Give some. Give it up. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> but if not that, I would have to go Ruby. Ruby on Rails. Ruby, okay. Yeah. That's, you're more current there. <laughs> yes, current. Yes. One piece of advice for the parent of a budding computer scientist. Trust their interests and where their passion lies. I think uh, often as parents, we try to, um, we kind of try to write the script for our kids as opposed to trusting that where their passion is, they can be find success there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one more, person real or fictional, living or dead, that you'd want to have dinner with? Absolutely, without a doubt, I want to have dinner with MLK. There you go. Yeah, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> But if it's living, now that's this. So you always have to living, be clarifying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Living, I would have to go with Oprah. Oprah. <laughs> please, please invite me. I you, will. Uh, I, I suspect that you, you, you might. Um, and, and, and so, you know, just, just before we, we move, move on to, to Q&A, you know, the one thing that we like to, to finish up these conversations with is, what's your kind of 60-second idea to change the world? 60 second idea to change the world. If I had a 60 second idea to change the world, I would ask all of the Fortune 20, let's say Fortune 20 companies that exist in the US today to donate 10% of their net profits every year to teaching kids code and technology. Wow. Off the top. That's good. That's a good one. Well, no, that, that would be an inspiring thing. So now, now we're going to go to audience Q&A, and I'll just uh, remind folks, uh, uh, please ask a question and, and be brief, and ideally a one-part question and an actual question. All right. <laughs> Hi, Kimberly. Thank you so much for coming to speak here You're today. Welcome. It's been fabulous learning about Black Girls Code. And I just wanted to ask about the outreach that Black Girls Code does, because I can see how a program like this 
can be more accessible to girls whose parents are aware of it or who are probably more economically privileged. So I was wondering if there was anything that the organization was doing to reach out to low-income girls of color. Yes, so as a focus for the program, we really try to make it um, cost accessible to anyone that wants to attend the program. So although we don't do anything particularly that's income driven, um, there are scholarships built into the program. So if a student comes from a household that can't afford to attend, we try to make that accessible. And then we also make sure that the cost of our class overall is well, well below uh, our market in terms of other programs that are comparable in the program. So most of our time when we do our summer camp, we generally offer that for free for students, maybe a small, small amount just to fund the program cost itself. But always being conscious that if anyone wants to attend the program, the price should never be a barrier. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Melanie. How are you? Um, um, so in recent lights of the diversity stats that was released by the tech companies here and the e economic pressure to perform, how will Black Girls Code evolve to train uh, young girls for leadership roles in, this, in these tech companies? So let me reset your question. So how, come back, don't we? I think I, I, you know I gotta ask a clarify. <laughs> you got me moving, us up. <laughs> so, so is your question, how are we responding to, to yeah. train them? Well, so for our program, as I mentioned before, you know, it is really focused on the technology, um, but it also has a lot of leadership development and entrepreneurship development built into what we do. So we're not necessarily just teaching them to pass the AP science at that. It, at APCS test, although we are doing that, we're really teaching them how to become leaders and how to form their own companies. Uh, so that is kind of how we're kind of creating this next level technologist that's not necessarily only going to work at Google. You know, our goal is really to create a student that can create the next Google. Hi, Kimberly. I'm Hi. Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Um, I want to thank you for your courage and willingness to be so innovative and um, have such an amazing impact on our young girls. Um, my question is, since you've had the opportunity to see girls all around the country and work with them, what are the gaps in programs and services that you're seeing that's really missing from our educational system, whether it's in the schools or the supporting nonprofits? Yes, well, a couple things. I think that one of the things that we found that's lacking, without a doubt, is a focus on providing resources to the parents. So generally, when we're working in low-resource, low-income communities, no one is talking to the parents. So I often get this question like, well, how do you encourage the parents? I was like, we don't really have a problem you know, showing parents that this is a valuable skill set that their students need to learn. But what we found that was missing is no one was talking to the parents. No one was saying, well, this is the path if your student is interested in technology. These are the career opportunities that are available to them. And this is how you can guide and mentor them along that path. Because once a student leaves school, you know, they're back in the home. So one of the things that, that we are trying to fill in the gap with our program is making sure we develop this relationship with parents, that we're um, not only doing workshops for the students, but doing parents' workshops as well, and training them on what we're doing with the kids so they can go back and support that when they leave our class. Um, so I think in, our, in, this, in this area for students of color, you know, no one sees a need. It's almost like they don't think our, parent, our kids have parents at home that care about them, but they do. And they come up, they get them up early on Saturday mornings to, so that they can start a better life for themselves. And it's so, it's often, I know I'm being long-winded, but it really is the parents that keeps me going because I will often get emails um, from a mother who says, you know, I dropped out of school and, you know, I'm on welfare, but I, how can you help me because I want to create a better life for my daughter. I want her to have opportunities that I didn't have. And then we have parents on the other hand that may be working and may be in fulfilling careers but also see a dearth of women that look like them in the tech field. So being able to provide support for those parents on all of the economic spectrum is what's missing now in the education space and I think what nonprofits can focus on. Yeah.
Hi. Um, Hi. I think this might be great follow-up. I'm, I'm very interested in asking a question, not just in relation to what's happening to the girls, but you're also an inspiration for other mothers that are looking to do things to really inspire their children to do something different. Mm -hmm. So I've created an organization called Parents of African American Students Studying Chinese. Yeah. And so the question that I have for you <laughs> is for other black moms out there that are trying to help their kids realize that they are one of a growing population, what keeps you focused, or, you know, in the beginning, mm -hmm. in terms of getting it started, and what are some things that you would want to say to other parents that are trying to start support groups so their kids feel more supported? I think I would say just finding like-minded individuals that you can pull into your tribe and your circle that keep you going. Uh, so for me, um, in the beginning, as I mentioned, it was my coworkers who were also moms, and when we started, we only had like we only thought we would have about six girls in that in the first class we ended up having about 10 but half of them were our kids and before we started the first class we like found all these coding workshops like all over the bay area and we took them to all so they were like our guinea pigs so like oh you need to go to this one here's another one let's take the girls and that's kind of how we built you know this organization this movement by what we saw as our needs as moms, but being able to connect with that tribe of mothers that understood you know, what we wanted to see for our girls, that made the difference. Um, as the organization has grown, it's definitely been finding other women that have organizations that are doing similar work and then finding those connections and those peer role models that helped me along the way. Uh, one of them here is uh, Nicole who has um, life courses and has another nonprofit that teaches young women and also boys, I think, about financial literacy. But she's another sister that's on this same nonprofit path of doing change for students of color. And having connections like that has been important to keep me growing, keep me motivated, and so that we can help each other. So definitely build those networks as you go. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you give us any advice um, doing similar programs of how to recruit volunteers? Well, for us, we were kind of lucky that we started in the Bay Area and we were in a tech hub and we were like right at this crux when there's this explosion of women getting involved in technology. So I would literally go to all the meetups that Women 2.0 and Women Who Code and Girl Develop had and I would stand up and I would do these lightning talks and that's how we got our very first volunteers. Uh, so really find, finding these affinity groups that have a shared interest in your mission and going right there and telling your story. So for me, you know, I tell my story a lot. My daughter is, she thinks she's a mini celebrity now, but I, I don't know. <laughs> but people know, they're like, oh, that's your daughter, because I talk about it a lot. But the reason I talk about it and the story is because I want people to understand why I do what I do. Uh, it, it's not for fame, it's not fortune, it's, it's, and there's no fortune in nonprofit. <laughs> but, um, it really is because I want to see change for girls like her. But being able to tell the story and to be able to tell people my story is very important. So being able to go out into the community, you've got to get out the office and go into the community, tell your story, you will find those folks that appreciate what you're doing and support you and definitely you know, really engage your potential corporate partners in, in doing the volunteer work. Hi, you really pointed to that moment in, at Vanderbilt when you've met the upperclassman who looked like you as a close mentor, and that was a pivotal moment. And I know that you have 2,500 volunteers who are technologists teaching your classes, but I want to hear a little bit more about what you see with the alumni and mentorship model that you built into Black Girls Code. Well, for Black Girls Code, we, we are lucky that most of our volunteers, I would say over half of them, or maybe 60 or 70 percent, are also women. And so you see these connections happening in each and every class. So I think when I often talk to other nonprofit leaders, they're like, how do you get so, your volunteers? How do you, do you have problems? We don't really have recruiting because there's a magic that happens when a mentor and a mentee make a connection in the classroom. So those are some of the things that happen. So we have mentors that 
uh, will start and take money out of their own pockets and start a scholarship fund for students that inspired them in the classroom. And then we also have older students that have graduated from the program that often come back and mentor. So two of my students, one is at Dartmouth, one is at Spelman, that came out of our New York program, came back down with us in New Orleans last summer and mentored the younger girls in a hackathon that we had. So those are some of the organic type of mentoring relationships we've been able to create. My name is Anadella Healy, and I was wondering how you could do to improve Black Girls Code. Like, what would you do? I would have Black Girls Code all across the U.S. in every U.S. I don't know if it's every U.S. city. Um, our goal is to reach a million girls, you know, by the year 2040. So, really, seeing our program expand is what I would like to see, and that's what I would focus on. And, and possibly Canada, because... And Canada, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely <they're>, Canada. <laughs> um, hi, thank you so much for having us all here. I feel like today is um, pure serendipity because I, too, was an engineering student in an engineering school, less than 1% that looked like me. If you could come and a little closer to the microphone. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. And um, my nine-year-old has recently learned and gotten excited about coding on Khan Academy. Ah! <laughs> Pamela, who does our coding videos, is in the audience, so it might be. <laughs> in addition, I have a World of Warcrafter, which I cannot get off the computer. Yes, I feel you. And it, in my case, it's a boy, and I have boys, and I was lucky enough to have boys and want to know how I can do for my boys what you've done for your daughter. Yes. And so, what would be the best starting place? Well, I, I think that we're lucky because um, there are so many coding resources around today that in three years ago there were not. So when I was talking about these organizations that were focused on teaching women to code, um, I think Sal like stole Pamela from Girl Develop It because that was where I was going beforehand. Um, and he's lucky because she's like a fantastic coder. You should really like talk to her though. And um, they have now have so many rich resources on Khan Academy, but there's others. So there's like code.org that has a, a rich resource of curriculum online. Um, there is um, the girls started coding on, uh, what did you guys start coding on? Uh, Scratch, Scratch, App Inventor and things like that. So definitely talk to them about the things that they started on because there's just lots of resources out there now that are online. And there are also other organizations similar to BGC that focus on boys. Hey. Hi, thank you so much you? for everything you do. Thank you. Uh, my name is CJ and I've gone back to college for my first BA after the age of 50. Yes. <laughs> I go to Mills College in Oakland, California. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm a member of the computer club there. And uh, you did address the question regarding people who are disadvantaged, girls who are disadvantaged financially, which I was, and as a woman, I, I still am, <laughs> sadly. But um, I would like to ask you about the question of other disadvantages. I have a disability. I have a mental illness, and I know many, many women and young, young women and older women with mental illness. And so we, you mentioned the, the financial disadvantages. Have you come across girls with uh, perhaps disabilities as a disadvantage? And how have you addressed that? Thank you. Yes, we have. So we often, you know, we don't do any particular screening for that because our classes are open to anyone who wants to register their child. Um, but we often do recognize in our classroom students that obviously have some type of learning disability in the room. But we do not focus on that as a disadvantage for them because coding, I, we believe that coding is a great equalizer because often the kids that are often thought of as disruptive in the classroom are some of the best coders because they focus right in and they get really engaged in that material. So one of the things that I think that 
is great about the opportunity to introduce coding to a wider variety of students is because of that, because it allows them to utilize the skill sets that they have that get ignored in the regular classroom. Yep. Hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, great talk. Um, love what you're doing. I wanted to say that uh, you're doing a wonderful thing with Black Girls Code where um, women and women of color specifically can come together, have a safe space in order to learn, talk, ask questions without feeling like they don't want to, you know, be the one in the class raising their hand, they're not worried about participating, um, and that's great, but then how do you prepare them to sort of move on to environments uh, like a professional workspace or a classroom where suddenly they've dropped right back into maybe being a minority, maybe, um, you know, being expected to act or dress within certain confines um, and just sort of that reality check that they'll have to prepare for. Yes. Well, I'll tell you a story. I'll try to make it quick, because I know we ran out of time. <laughs> um, I think it was in um, 2013, the beginning of 2013, we had an opportunity with one of our corporate partners to take a group of students with mentors from their company to the TechCrunch Disrupt Packathon. I was very concerned about that experience for them because I knew it would be this hot mess of testosterone and I was like, oh my God, I don't know about this. But we took the, group, the girls and as I imagined, it was this hot mess of testosterone. <laughs> And I had these flashbacks of like freshman year of college was like pizza boxes all over the place. But you know, interestingly enough, the girls loved it. And I was like, oh, okay. And you know, they really were able to adjust to the environment and still be able to hold their own. And stay, they stayed all night, coded all night, presented at the next day the presentation. And a similar experience I had with my own daughter, Kai, who I mentioned was, you know, started the program. She's been coding since, you know, three years, three or four years now. And just last weekend or so, I was dropping her off. She still codes, and she's in her high school robotics class. And she had a practice on the weekend, and I had to drop her off at one of the, the captain's house. So we're driving to the house. I'm in the Oakland Hills. Didn't ask any questions like moms do. We just go where the kids tell us to go. <laughs> And I pull up to the driveway for her to get out. Now, I've seen this team before, and I know that they only have like two girls. Um, so I wasn't really thinking about that. But when she got ready to get out of the car, um, I noticed that it's like four boys and Kai. And I was like, Kai, do you feel comfortable? I mean, is everything okay? And she was like, of course, Mom, what are you talking about? They're nice. What do you, do you think so? She's like, no, they're nice people. And, um, and as soon as she got out, they was like, hi, Kai, and they just went back to working on their robot. Uh, so, <laughs> and I still waited a good five minutes just to be on the safe side. <laughs> But I think the point of that story is that I do believe, I do really, really believe that this generation, Generation Z, I believe they are, they are changing. And I see differences in attitudes on both the, from boys, you know, as well as girls in terms of what does gender mean? What does race mean? So I see so much potential in this generation. And I also believe that what we're doing in Black Girls Code creates a level of self-confidence so that when they are going into those environments, and I tell them all the time, hey, it is not going to be changed. We're not going to change the environment probably by the time you get to the workplace. But my goal is to make sure that the girls that are coming through our program have enough self-confidence. They have enough self-assurance. They will absolutely, if it's the last thing I do, have the same level of skill sets that any of the boys that they're going to be in their freshman year at CS. And I think having that level playing field allows them to navigate all of the other biases in a way that they wouldn't without a program like BGC. Hi, um, I'm a current engineering student at UC Berkeley, so Sal, thank you so much for Khan Academy. It's got me through my first two years of college. All right. <laughs> Uh, Kia, I gotta say, go Bears. <laughs> and, um, you know, man, my question for you is, uh, I'm in a class in Berkeley where we talk a lot about 
a, lo a lot of current issues. Um, one particular week we talked about women in engineering. So the assignment for me was to go in my engineering classes and count how many women were in my discussion sections. And in two of my discussion sections, about 40 people each, there were uh, three women. Um, so I was, I got, this is the first time I really opened my eyes to this issue and I asked to be put in touch with a freshman engineer who was, oh, my question is, um, <laughs> that was, uh, uh, what would you tell, I have a friend who's a black uh, engineer and she's a woman and she doesn't like her classes because there's no one in her class who's like her. They're all male and, and they're not black. What would, and she's really wants to quit, but I don't want that to happen. What can I tell her? What would you tell her? Don't um, quit. <laughs> well, first of all, definitely don't quit. But I think it's important to find, I definitely think it's important to have a support system. So as a woman in technology, support systems like Women 2.0, support systems like Women Who Code, support systems like Girl Develop It, finding other women who code and women coders, that is what's going to help her. Just like in, in my particular case, it was that my close friend who became one, one of my first mentors. Without that, I think it's very difficult to kind of navigate that path alone. So. And Nesby, yes, Nesby, Nesby love. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for, for everything you do for, for our kids. Um, my, my daughter is nine and probably has some learning differences and also often as the only person of color in her environment needs to be reminded that she has ability and talent and, and to be supported in that way. I'm wondering what you would say to, in general, what is it that women of color can bring to the technology sector that is going to elevate it, change it for the better in ways that it wouldn't have been had women of color not, not been able to penetrate it? That's a great question. So I always say that, you know, for me, I'm not, I don't want to say the name of the CEO who said that she wasn't a feminist, but I make no qualms about it. I am a feminist. I am a womanist. That is me. That is what I believe. And I think that, you know, not just women of color, but I believe that all women bring a different level of sensibility to any field that we tap into. Uh, we tend to be more collaborative, we tend to be more creative in, in ways that often our male counterparts are not. And I think those are things that are going to help the industry to really transform itself and be more impactful. Uh, I think that technology as a tool is like immense, what we could possibly do with technology. But we have not yet, I believe, really tapped into its potential. I mean, we have good dating apps, we have good <laughs> find a restaurant apps, but are we really solving the hard problems of the world using technology as a tool? No, and I think that is because, without a doubt, because women are not at the table. And when we bring women to the table, I think then we open up technology to its full potential of really being a social change level. Well, I think I think we could we could chat here all night, but I know I, I, I I'm speaking you I for could talk. yeah no. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm speaking for myself, but I think for all of us here, this was a really inspiring conversation. Yes. We look forward to seeing where where you go with with Black Girls Code. Very Thank exciting. You. Thank, Thank you, Sal. Thank you.